This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our Healthy You webinar series. Today's topic is comprehensive support for critical times. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will always remain anonymous. Today's presenter is Dr. Devlin. Uh, Dr. Devlin, I'll get your slides up and then uh, we'll get started. Very good. Okay. Uh, should I wait a little bit or should I start? Nope, you're good to go. Okay. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Healthy You. And uh, today we're going to speak about uh, supportive care and, and what we do here at Mather um, and giving a general informational session about palliative care, um, also known as supportive care in some of the subsets of our um, care continuum. So I'm the Dr. Melissa Devlin. I am the Director of Palliative Care here at Mather. Uh, I can go to the next slide. And we're going to just, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about palliative care, advanced illness. We'll go through some symptom management, prevention, uh, talk a little bit about caregiver roles, planning, and um, finish up there. Next slide. So what is palliative care? You can go to the next slide. Um, palliative care came about probably a few decades ago, um, and it is a, an important piece of uh, comprehensive care throughout our medical journey. Um, something to understand in our demographics here in the U.S. is that the year 2030 marks an important turning point where, according to our Census Bureau, uh, our national population will be projected to be almost uh, out, you know, the adults outnumber the uh, under eight, under 18. So 78 million people, 65 years and older by 2035. And that is uh, quite a chunk of, of, of our population. Um, patients uh, in this population are more apt to have medical issues and seek medical uh, attention. And it's important to have an understanding of what keeps us healthy and what care we are needing, as well as a continuum of care throughout the medical course of your illness journey. Go to the next slide, please. So palliative care is an actual specialty of medicine that focuses on prevention and relief of suffering regardless of the stage of the disease or need for other treatment. It expands the traditional disease treatment model to include uh, quality of life, optimizing function, not only for the patient, but also for their family. Communication with in the medical teams that are caring for the patient, as well as within the family and patient and facilitating the patient's autonomy and access to the information and allowing them to choose. It can be delivered concurrently with life prolonging care or can be the main focus of care. Next slide, please. So here at Mather, we have a mission statement for our team and it's to improve the quality of life for patients who face life-threatening illnesses by providing pain and symptom relief, spiritual and psychosocial support from diagnosis through the end of life. Our core principles include compassion and dignity for those suffering with serious illnesses and relieving the stress and concerns of their families. It's also a priority of our team to provide education for fellow healthcare professionals as 
to the benefits of providing palliative care and thus influencing healthcare delivery as a whole. Next slide, please. So it's important to know that we remember certain things in our in our journeys. And in, you know, this is a quote from Maya Angelou that I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's one of the core principles that we kind of hold true in our team and, and in our hospital as a whole. Next slide, please. So our team here, I'm in the center. Um, my colleague, Dr. No, is uh, to my right and Phyllis Macchio is to our left. She's a nurse practitioner. Dr. No is a physician. We all help um, coordinate care throughout the facility in various areas of our hospital and help with um, continuing of care for patients who have advanced illness or serious illnesses and can be life-limiting or life-threatening. Next slide, please. So a lot of myths and facts that come along with palliative care. Um, some people tend to think that palliative care is the same as hospice. Um, you know, they think that you should stop all your other treatments if you become palliative um, or give up your other physicians who care for you to receive palliative care. Um, and that is only helpful during a crisis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, the, you know, that's, those are our myths and, and misconceptions. Um, palliative care is throughout a continuum of care um, through, a, you know, the start of the diagnosis of the illness and throughout the treatment course whether the patient be in the community or in the hospital and guiding the patient and their family through the different paths of that journey, as well as supporting them through all of the, uh, the different uh, options of treatment, coordinating the care within the team and expanding the team if there needs to be other professionals involved. Next slide, please. So it's an important layer of support. It's specialized support for serious illness. Um, it's patient and family-centered care, and it's close par partnership between all the different care teams, including um, extended care, social work, et cetera. Next slide, please. So advanced or chronic illness, um, some of those that fall into that category, just to make you aware, cancer obviously is, is something that can become more of a chronic or advanced process. Uh, progressive and chronic diseases such as heart failure, COPD, renal failure, liver failure, even HIV AIDS um, become, they're chronic and, and be can become progressive. Uh, symptoms may increase over time. Neurodegenerative illnesses such as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, different forms of dementia, Parkinson's disease, which is a movement disorder, and uh, strokes. Acute devastating conditions are often um, very shocking and, um, and, and can cause a various effect on family members and even care um, providers. And those are things that oftentimes do need additional support from our team, like a, a, an acute stroke that ha is, is a massive um, effect on function or, um, intracranial bleeding or brain bleeding, uh, different traumas, um, you know, hip fractures, head injuries, or cardiac arrest where the, where the heart stops and we have to revive the patient. Um, so all of these things kind of fall into that advanced or chronic illness category. And some of these folks are the ones that tend to come back and forth to the hospital more uh, frequently due to their symptoms. You can go to the next slide, please. So we deal with symptoms and that's our, our primary push is again, to prevent and relieve suffering. So some of the common symptoms that we handle are pain, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, different GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, constipation, delirium, which is an altered sensorium and the psychological and spiritual distress of patients that are facing serious illness. Next slide. So pain management, we do have a chronic pain management team in the hospital here, and we collaborate with them readily. Um, we are 
currently working with expanding our reach into the outpatient community, um, but we do have outpatient providers as well that we are in connection to, uh, and we do have an interventional radiology team here in our hospital that does um, a lot of invasive pain management, such as nerve blocks and um, different procedures like that. We use a multi-modality approach. We, we, we kind of go from all angles. Um, if there's a desire to spare the use of narcotics or opioids, we can use other agents and work with the patient. And the pain management team has their own holistic care practitioners that can perform um, non-medical approaches such as acupuncture and Reiki, uh, as well as aromatherapy, which can sometimes help. Um, next slide, please. Uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath is a very complex symptom that is often related to chronic breathing issues like asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, um, pulmonary fibrosis, but it also can be related to other conditions, including um, building up of fluids in the lungs or in the abdominal cavity from heart failure, liver failure, renal failure. Um, and the relief of excess fluids with various treatments can be done. Um, sometimes there's drainage of these fluids, uh, alteration of medication regimens, uh, alteration of diet, and we give medications to help with the relief of um, the fluids and relief of that feeling of breathlessness or that you can't catch your breath. Uh, sometimes those medications include opioids or narcotic drugs um, and non-opioids like anxiety medications. Sometimes we use medicines to manage secretions in the throat. Um, sometimes just repositioning and giving some oxygen can help. Uh, and in the hospital, we, we provide other delivery systems for breathing support, including um, commonly the CPAP machine or the BiPAP machine, which is a tight fitting mask that helps a person breathe. Next slide, please. Um, GI symptoms, again, nausea, vomiting uh, are the top two that are often related to GI uh, diseases. Uh, there can be uh, different feeding modalities like uh, feeding tubes. There can be bowel obstructions from um, post-surgeries or cancer-related um, you know, conditions. It can be from irritation of medications, not only from chemotherapies, but other medications um, can be electrolyte imbalance. So those are met, we try with IV medications. Um, sometimes we can give a patch, sometimes, um, you know, just different calming environments can help with uh, decreasing the nausea and vomiting. Um, sometimes we give motility agents that help with the uh, flow of the gut, including treatment for constipation. We increase the dietary fiber, can um, make sure that the patient has a good water balance so that the colon has water to draw in so that the bowels can, can work, um, laxative therapies and beyond. Um, some people have a loss of appetite. This can happen in various forms of illness. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with COVID now, uh, COVID can alter, alter your taste. You can have lack of taste. You can have loss of appetite, just feeling really not wanting to eat for various reasons, um, just not feeling well. Um, so there's different appetite stimulants. We talk about um, supplementation of the diet with different, um, you know, liquid supplements, uh, you know, like different insurers and, and stuff like that. You could have um, medical cannabis, uh, or its derivatives. Um, and sometimes with the alteration of taste, you just need to supplement different vitamins. Sometimes zinc and selenium um, supplements help with the restoring of taste um, sensation. Next slide. Delirium is uh, something that's defined as an acquired disturbance of attention and awareness. It's usually accompanied by a change in their baseline uh, mental status or cognition. Uh, there's kind of two types, hypoactive delirium versus the hyperactive. Uh, hypoactive delirium, people can be just very sleepy, kind of almost comatose. 
Uh, hyperactive delirium patients can be very agitated, um, restless, can be kind of pulling at their clothes, unwilling to cooperate with treatments. So some of the most important treatments is having family at the bedside, reorienting the patient to what, you know, the time and, and, and the space um, that they're in and why they're here. You know, you're in the hospital, you're here for pneumonia, you're, you know, um, your daughter, just kind of reminding things of normalcy. Uh, time I have kind of in, in capital letters because the best treatment for delirium is actually time. Um, you treat the underlying illness, but also time um, to let the body kind of sort itself out. And in extreme cases of hyperactive delirium, sometimes we do need to use antipsychotic medications for the patient's safety. Um, delirium can prolong hospitalization and complicate the course. Uh, and it does often have an, uh, an uptick in mortality. Um, and it can be present, uh, it can be present at end of life as well um, in that form of distress and a patient facing their fate. Um, and, and those are different things that our team can help uh, remedy and help um, the family kind of understand better and to cope with. Next slide, please. Um, we do have psychological services here um, and we do also have some spiritual support. Anxiety is very common in patients who are have serious illness, especially with those who have um, poor prognosis, uh, they have breathing distress that comes with their illness. Um, these things promote a lot of anxiety. Um, so this can be eased by talk therapy, uh, presence of family, medications uh, at times are needed just to help, um, sometimes just to help induce sleep for, for people who are anxious and they get more anxious at nighttime to help with insomnia. Uh, depression also can affect both family and patient. And we would coordinate psych services to help um, meet your needs. Uh, we do have, like I said, psych services here in the building and there's outpatient psych as well. Um, and then again, our holistic um, practitioners that are part of the pain management services can provide uh, Reiki, aromatherapy, acupuncture, guided imagery, um, and different um, support modalities. And the spiritual suffering is something that's very um, common, but not often talked about in medicine because, you know, we talk about medicine, um, but we do have patients who are having that spiritual struggle. And if um, our team does not feel that they can help, um, they have, we had, we do have a hospital chaplain who is interfaith. Um, and we do have our local uh, Catholic priests and Jewish rabbis that come visit the hospital and work with a uh, conjunction of our with our team for your patient and family spiritual support as needed. Next slide, please. So something a little more positive, um, healthy habits. Uh, there's ways to stay healthy as we age, um, you know, keeping yourself out of the hospital and keeping yourself um, in the right frame of, of health is important. Uh, there's many preventative screenings out there for cancer. Um, just for an example, um, the CDC recommends screening for cancer of the breast, cervix, colon, and lung. Um, those are the top four. Other types of cancers um, that are out there have not been proven um, to be, it's not been proven to be beneficial to screen for them. Um, but just to go over some of the, the common uh, things that the CDC recommends uh, for patients, um, females typically age 40 and above get a, a mammogram every year um, up until age 50. And then you can go every two years unless there's a high um, preponderance in the family and there's family history they go um, you know based on what your doctor recommends uh, typically earlier than 40 if there's a high prevalence of cancer in the family. Cervical cancer is your pap smear or HPV testing that can be done starting at age 21 um, and you do it every three years after normal um, 
after you know a, a normal screening test and um you can stop by age 65 unless otherwise directed by your physician. Um, colon or colorectal screenings are started at age 45, and that's for low-risk patients. Uh, if there's a prevalence of um, colon cancer in the family or uh, inflammatory bowel diseases or a history of polyps within the family, uh, they may recommend screening at ages earlier than 45, but typically you do um, a colonoscopy ages 45 to 75, and then greater than 75 years of age, you ask your doctor um, because at that point you have to kind of weigh the risk and benefits of the screening test. Lung cancer uh, screenings are for those who are at risk only. So age 50 to 80 years old, with risk factors of greater than 20 pack years of hit smoking history, current smoking or quitting smoking within the last 15 years. And the tool for screening is a low dose CAT scan. And again, those are only for the risk patients. Um, but those are some ways that you can prevent um, or screen for uh, common cancers. Uh, know your family history, speak to your family members, speak to your doctor, maintain your health by going to your regular doctor visits, including dental health. Um, you should get cleanings every six months, I believe, and x-rays once a year for your teeth. Um, you should be going to your general practitioner daily, uh, a yearly for a physical, unless otherwise recommended or if you have a specialist that follows you for your special advanced illness, like you go to the pulmonary doctor for your lung disease or the cardiologist for your heart disease, maintain those good relationships with your regular doctors and go to their uh, follow-ups and appointments. Uh, maintain your nutrition by having a balanced diet, including fiber and, and water, fruits and vegetables, uh, including some supplements if that's something that would benefit you. You can always have a nutritionist consult when you're in the hospital, or you can ask your physician to recommend a nutritionist. Many endocrinology doctors have those in their offices as well. Stay active. Just move your body, whether it's just a simple walk. Um, some people enjoy swimming, golfing, Tai Chi, things that just keep your muscles moving and keep yourself active, blood pumping, oxygen flowing, and stay sharp. Keep your mind active. If you're retired, you know, work on um, different volunteer activities, join a, um, a Mahjong group and play card games and do some reading or word puzzles. There's all different things that are there to keep your whole body healthy, mind, body, spirit. Next slide, please. Sometimes we become a caregiver. Um, sometimes we're the patient and we need to be cared for. Um, as our population ages, um, you know, uh, our middle-aged adults like myself are caring for their elderly parents and it becomes another job. And for those of us all working, we have many tasks, including caring for our, our aging population. And this can be a physical task, whether, you know, helping with their daily living activities, administering their medications, driving them to doctor's appointments, helping them walk with walkers and additional um, tools, preventing falls, helping with wound care, making sure there's proper nutrition. Um, it can be very taxing emotionally. Um, we help with the relief of sharing the burden. Um, there's a lot of anxiety that goes with helping a patient or a family member with their course of disease. There's the fear of the unknown. Where there's not a clear prognosis. Um, there's a lot of expectations, uh, whether positive or negative, we, you know, patient gets sick and gets in the hospital, your loved one is sick in the hospital, we expect them to get treated and get better and get out of the hospital. You know, those are some of the expectations. 
um, grief in advance of loss. If we know that the patient or our loved one is, is going through a terminal illness, we know that there is going to be an end time. And sometimes there's this anticipatory grief process where we kind of panic knowing the end is coming. We just don't know when. Um, so there's a lot of uh, complexities to that. It can be very isolating uh, when you care for a, a sick person, um, whether it be your spouse, your your child, adult child, uh, your aging parents, another loved one in the family. It is very isolating. You are on task to help them. You're not doing your normal daily activities, but providing assistance for that person that you're caring for to help them get their daily activities done. It can be financially distressing. I have to go to work, but I have to get care for when I'm at work. So I have to pay someone to care for my loved one. Um, those types of things are very, very, very common. And it can become a whirlwind. And in, this is part of what we do in our facility. We help um, with many facets of these things including with um, collaborating with social work and some of our outpatient resources. Next slide, please. So now it's time to plan. Um, what are the things that we need to plan in advance? Next slide. Advanced care planning um, is discussing thoughts and wishes regarding one's future medical care and planning how to go about future medical decisions and treatment preferences when it comes to serious illness. There's really five big steps. Think about what matters most to you or your loved one. Um, talk, have meaningful conversations within the family, extended friends or, or medical providers who you trust and have a relationship with. Put it in writing, document your wishes or your decisions. Um, there's different ways that we can go about that and I'll get to those in the coming slides. Um, and then share those documents that you do create with your providers as well as family and friends so that they know these are your decisions and this is what you want to happen in certain circumstances. And review them. Periodically, your medical needs may change. And maybe you want to change those decisions. And that's a extremely common and it's your right to do so and that's something that our team will guide you through if you're in the hospital you're at Mather next slide please so just um, a common term thrown around is called a healthcare proxy this is actually a person who is appointed by the patient to be their voice when their voice is not able to be shared for whatever reason. Uh, some patients become incapacitated for one reason or another, and they need someone to be a backup person. This is a person who that patient denoted, a patient who ha that has to be 18 years old, the person that they, they select has to be 18 years or older, and they must, the patient who's appointing that person has to have capacity meaning they understand that they're electing a person to make their decisions in their behalf, knowing that you're going to speak to that person and have them understand the wishes in advance if the patient is unable to or temp temporarily or permanently unable to do so. And this can include life-sustaining treatment decisions, resuscitation, dialysis, feeding tubes, um, things of that nature. Um, a healthcare proxy can be um, also referred to as a healthcare power of attorney. Those are oftentimes um, created by lawyers. Healthcare proxies can be done in your doctor's office, can be done at the hospital, it can be done by a social worker, a care planner from your um, home care team, etc. Um, they just have to be witnessed. Um, they don't necessarily need to be notarized, depending on who um, creates the document with you. If you do not create or appoint someone to be your proxy, 
Instead, um, we go by the New York State health laws. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of healthcare proxy. This is a form we use at our hospital here and is used in most of the hospitals that I've been in in New York. Um, and basically it's the patient writes their name and they appoint said person with their um, information on their phone number, especially. They can also put a um, secondary person, which is optional. And they can fill out these optional parts about, you know, different uh, healthcare decisions. And then the patient has to write their name, sign it, uh, date it. And then there has to be two witnesses that are not the person's named. So um, if you do this at the hospital, it could be your doctor, your PA, your nurse practitioner, your nurse, your social worker, and another person uh, on the care team or another family member who's not the person named as the proxy. Uh, next slide, please. If there's no proxy appointed or if there's no record, we don't have that piece of paper and no one can find it. We don't know, you know, was it done? Is it done? Is it at Stony Brook? Is it, you know, in a safe deposit box somewhere? Um, there is New York state law, um, which is the Healthcare Decision Act. Um, it was written originally in 2010 and it is updated as of 2019. And there's a surrogate hierarchy. So if you don't have a paper that says, my son Andrew is my healthcare agent or proxy, then it goes by this law. If you don't have a spouse or children, it can be a court appointed guardian. It could be your parents if they're you know, alive and you have no other family members. If you have your parents are predeceased and you have siblings, it could be your siblings. Um, you can even be a close friend if you have absolutely no blood relatives left. So this is something that we go through when we try to find if there's no other um, other documentation stating it was said person, we go by this hierarchy. Next slide. Um, this is an example of a New York State living will. Um, this is a very uh, common form that um, people can fill out with their, oftentimes with their lawyer. Um, sometimes if you're doing uh, further planning, which I'll get to later, a little later on, um, the lawyer can do a more elaborate living will, but this is very um easy one to do. And it talks about um, different, uh, you know, instructions apply if I'm in terminal, if I'm permanently unconscious, if I'm, uh, I'm conscious, but I have irreversible brain damage, things like that. And they state um, what the, their wants and do not wants. Um, and it can, and it, and it includes appointing a healthcare agent in the same document. So this is just an example. There's other um, ways that you can go about doing that. I showed you the other healthcare proxy form first. This is a living will that includes a healthcare proxy as piece of, a piece of it. You can go to the next slide. Five wishes. Um, if any of you guys go to Florida, uh, Florida does the five wishes um, as their main goals of care uh, determinant. Uh, and it's, you know, my wish for the person I want to make my care decisions for me when I can't, the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want, how comfortable I want to be, how I want people to treat me, and what I want my loved ones to know. And it's kind of like a little booklet. And those are those five questions, those five wishes. What are the things that you want? Um, and those are things that, um, like I said, can change, but are very important. It's important for your family to know, and it's important for your healthcare providers to know. Next slide, please. This is the form um, called a MOST form or Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. This is our New York State Department of Health form. It's typically um, pink in color, and uh, it is recognized throughout New York State in any healthcare facility, including rehabilitation centers, 
in different nursing facilities, even by paramedics and police officers who respond to 911 calls at the house. If they see one of these, they know to read it and understand what the dis, you know the distinct sections are checked off for. And this goes through a patient's wishes for life-sustaining treatments. And it's pretty specific. And this typically is filled out by the patient. If the patient fills it out, um, it cannot be changed by anyone except for that patient. If it is filled out by the healthcare proxy and the medical needs change, the healthcare proxy can change it if the patient remains uh, incapacitated. So these are um, the, the first two pages, actually a four page form, um, kind of a booklet, if you will. And the first two pages are, are pictured here. The first page talks about if I have no pulse and no, and I'm not breathing, uh, I'm essentially gone. So do I want you to attempt to revive me or do you want to allow a natural process? Do not attempt to revive me or resuscitate. Um, that's the, that's the first decision. And that goes through other different parts, including when I have a pulse and I'm breathing, but I may not be breathing well enough. Do I want to have a breathing machine, whether it be with a tube or a mask? Do I want none of those? Do I want to go to the hospital? Do I want to stay home? You know, what are the treatment guidelines, uh, you know, on the next page, it goes over, you know, do everything, do things that make sense or that treat the treatable or just make me comfortable, you know, within the realm of, of relieving pain and other symptoms. And it goes into artificial nutrition and hydration, antibiotics, dialysis, and any other things that may be coming up. Some people do not want blood transfusions. Um, that can go on, you know, this other section. And these are um, signed and documented by either the patient, their healthcare agent, their Family Healthcare Decision Act surrogate. Um, and then, you know, if it's a minor, there's parent guardian. There's also something called a 1750B surrogate, which is for those with um, intellectual impairments and the that goes through the state, which is a whole talk for another set of people. Um, and then it has to be signed by an attending physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant, um, and it has to be dated and timed effectively. And there needs to be two witnesses. Next slide, please. Now, the third page really goes over whether these decisions hold true when a patient maybe has this fill this out in the hospital and then they go home and they don't come back to the hospital for another three years and they come back and we see, oh, we have this in the system. Is this still what you want? Yes. Okay. So then we write on October 17th, 2023, Dr. Devlin reviewed this form with said patient at Mather and there's no change. Done. And that goes into the chart. Um, if there is a change, obviously you can make a new form. Um, and sometimes they just decide to take out the decisions and then they just void the form altogether. But this is that page for that. The fourth page is just um, kind of a, a bunch of instructions. So I did not include a copy of that because it's not very uh, helpful and tiny print. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do? How do we plan? Um, this is more of the financial and um, getting your affairs in order sort of thoughts. Um, but it's important to do that. Um, even at a young age, you get married, you buy a house, you start having a family, uh, and you want to protect your assets, you want to have things lined up for the future. You can have an attorney assist with completing of a will, um, again, power of attorney, which is financial um, powers for your assets um, and planning different things, whether it be your living will, your most form, your five wishes, 
um, or, you know, a trust fund for someone in your family. Um, there's different um, websites I placed here. Um, some of them are legal. So if you are caring for your elderly, elderly family and you, you know, you want to have their affairs in order before they get more, uh, you know, sick and, and more unable to discuss these things, you can uh, look into getting an elder attorney to kind of go over that. Um, if it's already to the point where your family member cannot provide any kind of um, consent or have these conversations, you still have these resources and speak to an elder care attorney. Um, there's different um, New York Health Access. Um, there's all different um, resources here, including um, how to get care. What are you eligible for? I didn't really go into hospice, but hospice is end of life care. It is separate from palliative care. It is something that is a Medicare funded benefit uh, for those who qualify. And if patients have a certain uh, type of disease with a certain prognosis that is um, quite poor, typically expected to pass within six months or so, and it doesn't have to be exactly six months, it can be much longer than that. Um, but if you qualify based on your disease process or your symptoms, you can you are eligible for Medicare funded hospice care benefits. Most hospice is done at home. About greater than 50% is provided in the home. Most of the care is provided by your family. If that is not feasible, then you have to look into other services. And that's why I put visiting nurse services of America. Medicaid sometimes can be a way to fund additional care in the home. And sometimes we do need to look into facility placement. Um, and there's different ways to do that. These are some of the resources and some of the um, um, different ways that you can go about kind of planning ahead. Uh, I think next slide. So with that, I'd just like to summarize a bit. And, um, you know, palliative care is a supportive form of care. It is a subspecialty of medicine, and it's a resource to you and your loved ones who have an advanced illness process or new acute care, care needs with ongoing goal setting for overall care. It can be delivered in conjunction with curative care or in preparation for hospice, and it can be provided in the hospital setting or in the community. And with that, I will uh, take your questions. Oh, there was one more slide, I think. <laughs> Thank you. It's just a picture. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Devlin, for your presentation. And uh, yes, if anybody has any questions, um, you can enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, all your questions will remain anonymous to protect your privacy. So we'll give it a few moments here to see if anybody has any questions. Doesn't look like anybody has any questions. Um, I guess we'll end it there. But um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. If you do come up with any questions, you can email them off to Mather Hospital at northwell.edu. Once you exit the webinar, you'll see a link to complete a brief survey. If you can please complete this survey, your feedback is extremely important to us and helps us plan for our future programs. Uh, I want to thank you all again for joining today's webinar. And if you'd like to view past Healthy You webinars, uh, you can find them at www.matherhospital.org forward slash Healthy You. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Devlin, and thank you, everybody, for joining. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care.